Raw milk is the latest social media fad. Influencers are coming out of the woodwork, hyping raw milk as a more natural option and nature's perfect food. But is there any science behind these ideas or is it just influencers doing their thing? I went over the most common claims about raw milk on the internet and I put them to the test by comparing them to the available scientific evidence. The main concern with raw milk is contamination with bacteria, which can cause food poisoning. This is exactly why we started heating milk before it's sold and consumed. This process is called pasteurization after the famous French scientist Louis Pasteur, and it's designed to neutralize human pathogens in milk. Historically, this process of pasteurization has been hugely successful. Milk used to account for 25% of food or waterborne disease outbreaks. And after pasteurization became widespread, it fell to less than 1%. But although it's much less common than it used to be, raw milk is still a concern. It's responsible for almost three times more hospitalizations than any other foodborne illness. And an investigation by the CDC concluded that in the US, consuming raw milk is 150 times more likely to cause a disease outbreak than pasteurized milk. And worryingly, these outbreaks disproportionately affect the very young, under 20 years of age, so children and young adults who may be particularly vulnerable. Okay, but how often is raw milk contaminated? In Europe and the US, it's a minority of samples. Anywhere between zero and 12% were found to be contaminated for each type of bacteria that they tested. Bear in mind, this is just data for four types of bacteria, so there could be many others. In some studies, up to a third of raw milk samples were contaminated with pathogens, and that includes milk from animals that look perfectly healthy. And symptoms of food poisoning can vary a lot. The most common symptoms are nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. In some people, food poisoning can be quite mild, even asymptomatic sometimes, whereas in other cases, it can lead to severe complications like septicemia, meningitis, or encephalitis. So why are some people running the risk? What's the upside here? Well, one argument put forward by raw milk advocates is that heating destroys proteins and the nutritious value of milk. So I looked into this, and while it is true that pasteurization can affect some nutrients in milk, the effect is pretty marginal. In fact, I was surprised to find out that in the US, the most common pasteurization protocol is 72 degrees centigrade for 15 seconds. So it's not even boiling. I actually didn't realize this. I thought pasteurization was much higher temperature. Now, in some other countries, they use what's called ultra high temperature treatment, which is heating the milk to 138 centigrade for two to four seconds. So this type of treatment, especially the pasteurization protocol, doesn't do much to the nutritional value of proteins. Most of the protein in milk, about 80% is casein, and casein is heat resistant. Another 18% or so is whey. And whey is more heat sensitive, but even there, the primary effect is not destruction of the protein, it's denaturing. Denaturing is to unfold the natural conformation of the protein. So it can affect the function of the protein. If it's a hormone or if it's an enzyme, it could stop having its natural function. But nutritionally, it's pretty much irrelevant because proteins are going to get unfolded. They're going to get denatured in our gut anyway during digestion. And actually, they're going to get chopped up because we absorb amino acids. We don't absorb entire proteins folded in their natural conformation. Some studies even suggest that heat might improve the digestibility of whey. Bottom line is when they compared the total protein content of raw milk compared to pasteurized milk, there was no significant difference. Fat content of milk, similar comparing total fat content of raw versus pasteurized milk, no significant difference. What does affect fat content significantly is whether the milk is skimmed or not, but that's separate from heating. As for minerals, calcium, for example, they're also heat resistant, so that's not a problem. Same thing comparing raw milk to pasteurized milk, indistinguishable levels of calcium. When it comes to vitamins, it's a bit more variable. Some vitamins like biotin or niacin are not significantly affected by heat. Other vitamins like vitamin C, for example, Pasteurization does affect vitamin C, but even there, the effect is fairly small, around 10%, give or take, reduction in vitamin C content after pasteurization. And vitamin C is low in milk to begin with. Milk is not really a significant source of vitamin C. For B2, for example, milk is a significant source of vitamin B2, and the reduction there with pasteurization is in the order of 1% to 3%. So it doesn't make a practical difference. 
So overviews of the scientific evidence have concluded that pasteurization doesn't significantly change the nutritional quality of milk. There are other factors that have a much stronger influence on the vitamin content of milk, like for example, the packaging material, exposure to light, how long it's stored for and at what temperature, those things can have more of an effect. Pasteurization, not so much. Another idea out there is that raw milk is better for bones and for teeth. It's better for bone metabolism. There's no compelling science to back this up. And as we said, calcium content of milk isn't really significantly affected by heat. And vitamin D, which also plays an important role in bone metabolism, is actually quite low originally in raw milk naturally. And it's much higher in milk bought in stores because most brands supplement with vitamin D. It's added later on. Another claim out there, another idea, is that raw milk is better for people who have lactose intolerance. So lactose is the main carbohydrate in milk, and it's broken down in our body by an enzyme called lactase. And some people can't produce lactase, so lactose can't be digested, which causes bloating, pain, and gas. So that's what we call lactose intolerance. But heating milk makes no difference for the amount of lactose in the milk, and also doesn't affect our ability to produce lactase. Now, one idea out there is that raw milk contains some bacteria that produce lactase, and that's what presumably would help people who can't produce their own lactase. This happens with some forms of dairy, like yogurt, for example, which contains some bacteria that can produce lactase. So this is why people with lactose intolerance often tolerate fermented dairy like yogurt much better than they do milk. But these bacteria are added to the yogurt during the production process. They're not present in raw milk in any meaningful concentration, so this doesn't work. In fact, scientists have tested this idea directly. People with lactose intolerance were split randomly and given either raw milk or pasteurized milk. Both caused symptoms. Similar intensity, it made no difference, which is exactly what we would expect. Now, importantly, the participants in these trials were blinded, which Sounds violent, but all it means is they didn't know which type of milk they were getting, if they were getting raw milk or pasteurized milk for each test. So this is important because it rules out what we call placebo effect. Sometimes, if we're convinced that a food or a supplement is beneficial for us, we can feel better and tend to psychologically downplay symptoms just by power of suggestion. The placebo effect is something that has been shown many times in science. It's very reproducible, very powerful. And so this is one reason that a structured scientific trial can give us answers that someone's story, someone's anecdote cannot. If you have lactose intolerance, there are a number of strategies that are backed by science. There are lactose-free milks. There are lactase supplements. There's fermented dairy like yogurt. We've touched on that. And there are plant milks, which are also lactose-free. Raw milk is not really one of those strategies. Another related version of this idea is that raw milk contains probiotic bacteria that provide benefit. And by heating, we kill those bacteria and we lose those benefits. But like we said, bacteria like bifidobacteria and lactobacillus, these bacteria that are usually linked to benefits are present in raw milk in very low concentrations, nowhere near what would be necessary to provide a benefit, unlike the case in yogurt. In fact, when the levels of bifidobacteria in these types of organisms go up in milk, Often that's an indicator of fecal contamination of milk. So those bugs are more common in the gut of the animal. So the feces can sometimes contaminate the udder and it ends up in the milk. Not a good reason to consume a product. Another idea out there is that raw milk is better for the immune system, that it can help prevent, maybe even cure some allergies. So this is the one idea about raw milk where it got a little more interesting. There are several studies suggesting a link between early exposure to farm milk or raw milk, so early in life, first few years of life, and a lower risk of developing allergies later on. They have not established that one thing causes the other, but there's enough of these observations and they've tried to tease things apart enough that I wouldn't rule it out. I think it's a possibility. There are several theories about which component or components of raw milk could cause this effect, so this is being studied. But again, these observations usually pertain to early exposure, first year of life, first few years of life. So if you're 30 and you're drinking raw milk because influencers are telling you it's gonna cure your allergies, that is not what these data are about. As for the kids, I do not recommend giving raw milk to a child, to a baby, and risking food poisoning to shoot for this theoretical may or may not be causal effect. 
I'm not here to tell you what to do. That's never what these videos are about. But I'm just being very clear that I don't recommend exposing a child to the risk or actually any of these more vulnerable groups, the elderly, pregnant women, immunocompromised people, sick, hospitalized people. I wouldn't even do it myself and I'm not in one of those groups. You do you, but I'm especially emphasizing these more vulnerable individuals. There's ongoing research on this, including randomized trials, trying to figure out, number one, if it really is cause and effect, if exposure to raw milk or to farm milk early in life does lower risk of developing allergies, and number two, if so, what is it about the raw milk? If this pans out, it's something that could potentially be harnessed by using the specific factor to prevent allergies without exposing ourselves to the risk of infection. Now, for people who already have allergies to cow milk, this has been tested and both raw milk and pasteurized milk elicit allergic symptoms. There are some very small studies out there suggesting that the amount of raw milk necessary to elicit the symptoms is larger. So individual results may vary, but if you're allergic to cow milk, it's better to just leave it out and replace it with something else. Some people like soy milk, other people prefer no milk and getting the nutrients from foods. It's also worth bearing in mind that somebody living on a farm is probably drinking the milk much closer in time to the extraction, to it coming out of the cow, than somebody buying the milk at a store or getting it in the mail after several days of bacterial growth. The last claim made by influencers and wellness gurus in general are the antimicrobial systems in milk. So these are molecules that might play a role in immunity, can perhaps help slow down bacterial growth. They have really nerdy names like lactoferrin, lactoperoxidase, lysozyme, immunoglobulins. Uh, it's a nerd fest. So these are some examples of um, antimicrobial molecules. But these antimicrobial systems are not destroyed by pasteurization. In fact, they retain most, if not all, of their activity. Some retain about 70%, some retain all of their activity after heating. And the bottom line is they can't prevent contamination of raw milk anyway, as we saw, because samples of raw milk can be found to be contaminated. It's not that rare. In fact, when levels of lactoferrin or immunoglobulins are higher in milk, that's often an indicator of infection, of mastitis, the infection of the udder of the cow, and these molecules are produced to try to slow down the growth of the bacteria and they end up in the milk. So I think it makes zero sense to drink raw milk for the antimicrobial systems, which can't prevent contamination of the milk anyway. When we have pasteurization, which accomplishes exactly that goal and it's much more effective. The raw milk fad is a typical example of what we call a naturalistic fallacy. Basically the idea that anything that's more natural should be better, should be healthier. Naturalistic fallacies sometimes get it right and sometimes get it very wrong. So we can't trust them blindly. They're not really critical thinking, they're basically storytelling. As a review of the scientific literature concluded, raw milk is not inherently safe and it carries significant food poisoning risk. Media claims were shown to be myths. Pasteurized milk has an excellent food safety record. Personally, I don't consume any milk, cow or plant milks, just personal preference. But if I was gonna consume some cow milk, it would definitely be the pasteurized kind based on the evidence I've seen. But now you have the information in your hands so you can make your own educated choice. So if influencers are milking you for clicks, sorry, horrible pun, or for credit card swipes or whatever, remember, just ask for the evidence and stay safe out there. Every week, we answer common questions about food and health. Here's a recent one. Is fruit just sugar or are there other benefits to it? Or click this one down here for 10 simple tips to lower your blood pressure. Check them out. I'll see you over there. Take care.